Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the CMI webinar series designed for and by our CMI family. And I'm Cynthia Howell, and I'm the Education Training and Outreach Manager for the Critical Materials Institute. And today I'm going to be your monitor for this uh, webinar. I want to tell you a little bit about our webinar series. And uh, first of all, we're hosted by Colorado School of Mines. And of course, uh, people on, on all over the nation here, as well as how we broadcast it the, um, these days. Uh, we'd like to ask that if you have any ideas for future webinar series that you would uh, connect with us. And uh, we've got our um, exit survey information on there as well, which is always important. That's a great way to put another recommendation or again, just to tell us how um, you thought the webinar went. This is a public webinar and a re recording is gonna be available in about a week. And you can find us at aims.lab, uh, aimslab, excuse me, dot gov slash CMI. Most of you know that's under the workforce setting uh, so that you can access these at any time. Uh, questions are gonna be held toward the end. Uh, we will do the Q&A. And if you look on your um, setting, you can see where you can actually type in the Q&A um, and have a question ready for us. I encourage you that as soon as you have a question to please place it in there. That way we'll be queued up as we get to that question and answer section. Right now, I'd like to introduce um, our presenters today uh, from, um, We have uh, currently McKinsey Lyon has a bachelor's degree in history and 16 years of experience in public affairs. And uh, she joined uh, Perpetua Resources in 2017, but she brought a lot of experience with her and her experience in, H in HR also was about helping uh, clients achieve business goals. So currently she's the VP of External Affairs and McKinsey leads the Direct Advocacy and Social License Development Department. And uh, she will join also on um, with Christopher Dale and he's an exploration geologist that brings about 35 years of experience um, in, in the metals industry. And um, he also has really spent his career across many different venues, many different businesses, large and small, in the critical materials commodities uh, area. So he's a great fit here for um, this organization. And he comes on uh, currently um, the exploration manager of Perpetua Resources. So I'd like to uh, not take any more time from these presenters. It's gonna be a great presentation. And I'd like for McKinsey, if you wouldn't mind taking over right now and starting this presentation. Well, thank you, Cynthia. And for everyone attending today, we very much appreciate your time. And as Cynthia mentioned, my name is Mackenzie Lyon. I am the Vice President of External Affairs for Perpetua Resources. And I'm very happy to be presenting to you today from my, my office uh, here in Boise, Idaho. I don't get into the office very often these days, so it's a nice opportunity. Next slide, please. So being based here in Idaho, I think we have a very unique appreciation for the role the Critical Minerals Institute the national labs and universities play in driving the innovation necessary for our nation to meet our energy, defense, and infrastructure goals. So from us to you, thank you for the work that you do. And we're excited to be here to discuss our project with you today and, and honestly to share our enthusiasm for a responsible approach to US mining that can redevelop and restore an abandoned mine site that can produce gold in the critical mineral antimony and then helps supply that antimony for the clean storage revolution. Now, our project is based in central Idaho, about four hours from where I'm sitting here in Boise. 
The district itself, though, has a long history of mining that starts back uh, in about 1899 when mining first started up in this district for gold and silver. But it was it was on the eve of World War II when this site took on a new significance because the blockade in the Pacific at that time meant that the United States no longer had a source of tungsten or antimony, which were needed for the war effort. So the government had identified that here at Stibnite, there was tungsten and antimony, and they commissioned the then Bradley Mining Company to produce those for the war. And Stibnite then went on to produce the majority of both minerals for the war effort, including about 90% of the antimony needed for World War II. And as such, the men and women of Stibnite, Idaho, were then credited with having shortened the war by a year and having saved a million American lives because of the critical nature that that antimony and that tungsten provided for the war effort. And I will say that it's very notable that the Berkeley National Lab was actually um, the folks who helped develop, develop the first flotation methods for Stibnite ores, specifically for the production of antimony here at Stibnite. So our history together goes, goes way back. And these methods are in fact still used today. And while Stibnite played this incredibly critical role in the past, and it's a role that we all should be really proud of for what it was able to accomplish. However, because most of the mining that has occurred up at Stibnite occurred long before our current environmental regulatory system, or even this ethos that we have on how to mine and how to leave it when we are done, so as a result, there are many environmental features and legacies that have been left behind, including today, there are 10 and a half million tons of unlined tailings and waste rock that are degrading water quality. Today, the East Fork of the South Fork of the Salmon River flows into an abandoned mining pit, which has blocked fish then from migrating to miles of critical habitat for over 80 years. And then there's just generally degraded habitat uh, throughout this historic district. And in between 2002 and 2012, there were then three CERCLA decrees signed regarding this site between former operators and US agencies that were involved in the work here up at Stibnite. And these agreements absolved those parties of any future responsibility for the environmental conditions at site. So now we're left in a situation where there really are no solutions for Stibnite without a Superfund designation or mineral redevelopment. And that's where, um, while the site needs this environmental repair, we also know that there are vast mineral resources still available. Today, we know uh, that our project economics are very much built on gold, about 4. million ounces of gold. But then also, we've been able to identify a resource of 148 million pounds of antimony. And so it's this gold resource at Stibnite that provides the economic basis for us to then mine the antimony and to restore the legacy features that exist at Stibnite today. And so we knew, and I will credit Chris Dale, who you will hear from in a few moments for this vision, but we knew from the very beginning that if we were going to go back into Stibnite and redevelop it for mineral extraction, we were going to have to bring with that project environmental solutions and social benefits. So really from day one, our plan was designed to use the resources of mining to clean up these legacies that remain from the past and truly leave the site better than it is today, while at the same time then responsibly providing for the, a domestic source, the only domestic source of the critical mineral antimony. So we built our plan based on this principle um, to restore as we go, to address these legacies as early on in the project as we could. In fact, in many instances in construction, so first in construction, we address the largest source of sedimentation um, that's happening right now at Blowout Creek. By doing that, we improve water quality and we also um, reestablish wetlands capacity in the upper drainage of this uh, creek that have been lost for decades now. 
The project has also been designed to, in the first years, pick up those remaining legacy tailings on site today, reprocess them, and then safely store them in our own fully lined and properly engineered tailings storage facility, which again, will also improve the water quality of the district. The project is also designed to reestablish fish passage. First, when we have to remine the yellow pine pit by creating a fish passageway, a series of weirs or a, a, a fish ladder in essence, to allow fish migration to be reconnected for the first time in 80 years in the very first years of this project. And then by year seven of the operations, when we are done mining, we will um, backfill the pit and, um, and then reestablish permanent fish passage. Next slide, please. And so being able to backfill the pit and reestablish this river really is one of the crown jewel examples of how mining and environmental legacy um, needs can be met at the same time. We're really proud of this example. Um, it allows us to reestablish the natural flow and gradient of the river and opening up 12 miles of habitat for adult Chinook, seven miles of habitat for adult bull trout, and over 30 miles of habitat for smolts and juveniles of both species before the project has even done. And so now um, just a little bit about permitting. We are in our fifth year of the NEPA process, which was followed by, or which followed six years of data gathering, engineering, and working with stakeholders to design our plan. In August of 2020, the US Forest Service released the draft environmental impact statement since then, we've been paying attention to those comments and those outcomes, and we've worked to refine the project to improve even more the environmental outcomes. So now the U.S. Forest Service, our lead agency, will issue a supplemental draft EIS in the first quarter of 2022. This uh, analysis will then evaluate our new kind of proposed action that's been improved and some alternative access routes to site. We then anticipate a final record of decision in 2023 and production in 2027. So here it is just important to note that should everything you know, stay on track um, on where we, what our expectations are today, this will have been a 16 plus year process from identifying the resource to getting it into production. And this is not a timeline that works if we want a domestic supply chain of critical goods. So I'm gonna take a, a, a turn here for a moment and just talk briefly about how antimony now plugs into our clean energy future. So through both the executive order on strengthening our supply chains and the Earthshot goals set by both President uh, Biden and Secretary Granholm, the nation has a clear set of objectives. We need to secure the building blocks required for a cleaner and safer future. And I think Secretary Granholm was absolutely clear that in order to reach a net zero carbon emission grid by 2035, we need battery storage. And that battery storage supply chain can be done right here at home. In fact, a fully integrated supply chain from innovation to mineral production to end use adoption is faster, more responsible, and a more secure way when it is done here at home. And we really can't imagine a better example of responsible, domestic, vertically integrated supply chains than with the Stip Night Gold Project. So last month, we announced that we've entered into a long-term partnership to provide a portion of the antimony from the Stip Night Gold Project to AMBRI. AMBRI is an American company started out of MIT Producing, producing a stationary battery uh, storage uh, uh, unit. And this battery technology is unique. The liquid metal battery relies on a combination of calcium and antimony. It is scalable up to two gigawatt hours. The batteries are reliable in any environment without the type of thermal loss that you can see in other kind of comparable systems. And they are already 30 to 50% lower cost than the comparable lithium ion batteries in the 2020 market. They also have 
a tw an over 20 year lifespan. And I think the, the really cool thing here too, is that Ambry has committed to US manufacturing of these batteries. So with this current agreement, uh, our antimony from the Stib Night Bowl project will power approximately 13 gigawatt hours of battery capacity. This is equivalent to eight times the battery storage that came onto the market in 2020 and enough storage to power a million US homes with solar power for the 20 year plus lifespan of these batteries. And this partnership further vision or this partnership furthers our vision of being a company that helps bring solutions and directly underscores the role modern mining can play in solving the world's climate change challenges and connects the restoration and operation of the Stibnite Gold Project to climate change solutions. So I will stop talking now and I'm gonna pass it, the baton over to Chris Dale, who is our exploration manager. And he's gonna talk more about antimony specifically at the Stibnite Gold Project and globally. So thank you. Uh, thanks Mackenzie. And thank everybody for joining us today and uh, CMI uh, for hosting us. You know, most of you know, uh, uh, antimony is a metalloid, uh, along with uh, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, tellurium, and a couple others. Um, and with that comes a lot of the multiple personalities that metalloids have, some of which are, are particularly useful in the metallurgical uh, world, but also in the electronics world, and of course, for defense. It's as rare in the Earth's crust as the element indium, if that means much to anybody. Um, and as Dr. Anderson, uh, who I think has joined us today, has noted in several papers, uh, uh, he's a bit of an antimony expert, to say the least. Uh, it occurs in hundreds of minerals, but really it only, uh, its major ore uh, mineral is stibnite, uh, although there are other uh, potential uh, sources in the, in the past production, for instance, uh, of tetrahedrite uh, in the Coeur d'Alene district, for example. But generally, stibnite's the primary ore of, of antimony minerals, and it's rare, um, so it, it, it's hard to come by. Next slide, please. Uh, it has a myriad of uses across numerous industrial sectors because some of its unique properties. Uh, for instance, it polymerizes like silica, so it's used in various binding agents and emulsifiers. It expands upon cooling, pretty important and very rare characteristic, making it extremely useful in various precision casting and metallurgical applications. It has a propensity to bind with other metals, which allows for it to, in the manufacture of very high purity optical glass with all the national defense and solar panel type uh, applications. And although the metal actually burns, uh, various forms of antimony oxides uh, are used in fire retardants. That's so actually uh, about 50% of its use worldwide is, uh, is in fire retardant applications. And they're common. Uh, and it's found in just about everything uh, you can think of where there's plastics uh, uh, in your car dashboard and aircraft uh, uh, plastics and the computer housing on your computer in your desk, the phone in your pocket. Uh, and importantly, the insulation and copper wiring uh, as we uh, look at these future applications of, of low greenhouse gas uh, backup battery systems to power things, there's going to be a lot of copper wiring and thus the insulation uh, that includes antimony use will be very, very important. And then there's a whole pile of national uh, defense applications that's been used in, in military munitions, uh, primers, bullets, flares, explosives, shrapnel for, for hundreds of years. So it's a pretty important uh, uh, set of historical uh, uses. It's a minor metal, but it's a very important metal in a wide variety of manufacturing and, and industrial applications. And as Mackenzie just noted, it's, it's really uh, coming into play now, I think, in these newer uh, liquid batteries. It has long uh, been considered a, a, an element of strategic and critical importance, not only by the U.S., but by its allies and our enemies. Uh, this goes well back before World War II. Um, Today, China, Russia, and their satellites dominate world production, and China clearly dominates the elements processing into usable products, pretty much controlling about 90% uh, of that end of the, of the uh, supply chain. And they basically have a monopoly on the markets. This is in part due to China's natural uh, metal endowment. The largest deposits in the world are found there. Uh, many of them, however, have been exploited and, and are, are no longer in production but it's also in part due to their constant and rather rigorous manipulation of the market. Uh, they flood the market with antimony when they want prices to drop to kill off the competition. Uh, and often they go out and buy mines and processors uh, as they start to enter the market and either shut them down or send the feedstock back to China to maintain that control. 
So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty vicious game, if you would, in terms of commodities. This chart is a map of a co-production dependency. Uh, it's a measure of an element's potential for recovery from deposits of other elements. And I've circled antimony, uh, and you can see it's way out on the outskirts of this uh, uh, chart, basically uh, indicating it, it, uh, it's, it's not really common uh, on its own, and it's not also not common as a byproduct uh, compared to a lot of other materials. Uh, and deposits outside of China that are primary stibnite deposits or primary antimony mineral deposits are pretty rare, and most of the world's uh, current production comes from this byproduct of gold mining in Russia, Tajikistan, uh, and hopefully uh, in, here at Stibnite. Part of the uh, source in the, in the US and, and, and Europe and elsewhere it comes from recycling uh, from lead acid batteries where it's a common constituent, uh, but that's not likely to change uh, over the near term or the long term because that's a mature uh, business sector. This graph uh, illustrates worldwide antimony reserve distribution. These are published reserves uh, from a variety of sources. And it shows the, the potential future sources of the metal, metalloids are, are mostly found in countries that are not friendly uh, to us. Those are those with the red bars. Uh, these are groups that are countries uh, and producers that aren't prone to honor human rights uh, or child labor laws or care much about uh, uh, modern environmental standards. And really the only major US deposit is found at Stibnite, Idaho, although there are others uh, that have some significant antimony. They are nowhere near as large as Stibnite, uh, both in Alaska, in Nevada, uh, and also in Idaho, uh, in North Idaho in the Coeur d'Alene District. The point I wanna make is many of the known deposits in, in both the friendly and unfriendly countries have significant deterrence to development uh, for a variety of reasons. And this includes some of the major deposits in Bolivia, Turkey, Mexico, and Australia. It really outlines the importance of Stibnite uh, as, a, as a future producer. And there's a lot of upside at Stibnite in terms of expiration potential. As it currently stands, uh, the project, uh, our reserve base, uh, would provide about approximately 35% of US demand for the first six years of mine life and probably uh, uh, a bit more uh, as, uh, as we continue expiration. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in the details of that kind of information, you could look in our 2021 feasibility study and our public filings that describe the expiration potential and upside of the district but also the, the development plans uh, as we currently have them. <clears throat> so a little bit uh, for those of you that like to geek out on, on flow charts and things like that, uh, this is a, a generalized, very, very, very generalized flow, flow chart uh, of our process. As I mentioned previously, uh, most antimony deposits recover antimony as a co-product or byproduct, although there are exceptions. And Stibnite has traditionally done that starting back in the 1920s when they first started mining here. Uh, this slide uh, shows uh, the general uh, simplified flow sheet and it essentially it's pretty simple. It's actually not dissimilar to what they used uh, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. After crushing and milling, uh, pyrite is suppressed and antimony is activated and floated into a high grade antimony sulfide concentrate. Uh, then the gold-bearing pyrite is reactivated and floated into a concentrate that's then oxidized and leads to produce uh, gold silver doré. A test work on further treatment of the antimony sulfide concentrate has included various conventional uh, pyrometallurgical testing methods, that's basically smelting and roasting, uh, and other hydrometallurgical methods. All show promise, uh, all have good recoveries and are viable options for the project. And, and this brings us to this, this next slide. And this is really the, the, the issue for uh, anybody in, entering into the antimony markets. Uh, the chart on the left illustrates the Chinese dominance of upstream production through downstream processing. Uh, purple colors are basically the producing countries, if you would, uh, the darker the color, the, the more antimony being produced. And the arrows show the, the traffic, if you would, uh, the size of the, of the arrows indicating the quantities. And it clearly shows China has got a stranglehold on the manufacturing and industrial sectors uh, based on uh, the, they utilize antimony because of their monopoly. Uh, the chart on the right shows most of the fire retardant formulations are produced in China, followed by Belgium. Uh, and you think, oh, well, Belgium, that's a good place. Well, most of their feedstock comes either from China or Tajikistan, making them highly vulnerable, as are other producers uh, in the world uh, that rely on that feedstock uh, to Chinese manipulation of the markets. Uh, just like the US. So what are the challenges? As our title indicated, there's a, there's a lot of challenges with brownfield sites. Uh, 
but we, we made a run at it and, are, and are, are chugging along trying to get through the process. Um, and these include typical things that you find uh, in most abandoned mine sites, which there are many across the Western US that are truly orphaned. And there are lots of complications as an explorer and a developer when you go into these things, both from a compliance and regulatory standpoint, uh, there, there's lots of deterrence to developing a site uh, like this. Uh, there aren't any good Samaritan clauses in the Superfund or CERCLA uh, Act. And so it basically opens developers and explorers up to lawsuits and litigation in sites like this when you try to go back into them, even if you're trying to be a good Samaritan as we are. Uh, recovery of metals from what are often low-grade ores remaining after the earlier periods of development or from residual waste from previous mining and processing are a headache, to say the least. U.S. is considered uh, one of the worst places in the Western world to permit a mine due to the length of time it takes to permit a mine uh, a project, as Mackenzie noted earlier. And that's also a deterrent from a financial perspective uh, to raise capital to go do these sort of things. And, and really, the, the crux of it for anybody, uh, including us, uh, is the lack of domestic facilities uh, to process antimony sulfide concentrates uh, into usable products. Uh, you don't typically use antimony sulfide. Uh, use other products uh, derived from that uh, raw ore material. So this brings us to some of the opportunities. And those of you that are joining us, I'd love for you to put on your thinking caps here. And uh, we're, we're open to discussion. Uh, there are lots of things out here that may be uh, pertinent and interest to, to the members of the CMI and, and other folks. Uh, we still need to continue, continue to advance our flow sheets if uh, we want to look at how to process our sulfide concentrates into something uh, more usable for industry. And that includes potentially uh, looking further into hydrometallurgical methods that they're likely to involve less greenhouse gas emissions than conventional pyrometallurgical uh, smelting processing. Uh, currently, there are no hydrometallurgical plants in the US or even North America. And it seems logical that maybe there are some friends at DOD and DOE and, and you folks in the Critical Min Materials Institute they might have some suggestions on how we might advance this endeavor. It wouldn't be the first time, as Mackenzie noted, that the national labs and our federal government have been involved at Stibnite, uh, you know, both with the flotation methods, but also the development of the district. I might want to point out here a couple things on this slide, uh, you know, from a, from, for those of you that really are uh, into, into the chemistry, uh, one of the challenges with hydrometallurgical methods, uh, if you're basically extracting an ore element of interest, in a solution, often one of the things that happens in a, in a lock cycle or closed cycle system, you end up loading that same solution, not only with your element of interest, in this case, antimony, you also end up ultimately loading that solution with a lot of other elements that may not be uh, preferred to be in your final product. And after a while, your process solutions become loaded to the point where you have to dispose of them. And that can be costly, uh, it, can, it can require a lot more environmental uh, handling, if you would, or special handling because these things may be loaded with uh, deleterious materials that you don't like. Uh, and so that's one of the challenges, looking at ways, how can you reuse these solutions and make them more efficient? Most of them aren't cheap to utilize. Uh, another point I, I want, might want to make is uh, that often when you look at sites like this, there are, and this is part of the deterrent for development, is there are often uh, surface and groundwater issues related from old legacy sites uh, like Stibnite, for instance, where you have to deal with water that is already contaminated, both from natural uh, background mineralization that produces higher levels of, of metals, or in our case, metalloids, uh, but also from anthropogenic sources from old past mining activities. And these are also challenges. Anemone and arsenic, which are two elements of concern on our site, are, are typically elevated. And so, you know, are there ways to recover those from wastewater streams uh, and keep them from hitting the environment? Those are very important aspects to us as developers uh, to make sure our site doesn't uh, degrade the site, but actually helps improve conditions up there. Uh, next slide, Mackenzie. All right. And again, I, I, I wanna thank everybody. Uh, we've got a, uh, a project here we, we spend a lot of time and energy on and we really appreciate the Critical Materials Institute folks uh, for allowing us to present it. Uh, we think that we've got a project that demonstrates a sustainable and responsible approach to modern mining. At the same time, we can develop a way to clean up an old beat up site where no one else is willing to step up to the plate to do it. And we can produce some uh, high paying jobs in a rural community that will last a long time and, and provide a uh, critical mineral production. Uh, and last but not least, obviously, uh, to help uh, find a way to 
improve uh, uh, world conditions by reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, with uh, larger uh, battery storage systems that we hope to be able to contribute to. Uh, thanks very much. I, I, uh, I appreciate again that everybody uh, joining us. Um, I'll turn it over to our moderators. Thank you so much, Dale and McKinsey. I want to thank you for an excellent presentation. It is so interesting to hear the process of restoration all the way to uh, the potential for this uh, particular mine and its cl uh, cleanup. Um, how valuable um, stibnite is and the in particular uh, for many, many different areas uh, from defense to technology to green energy. And um, I know that uh, this presentation is hopefully stimulating a lot of potential partner ideas um, as you went through your presentation. And right now we'd like to open it up to questions. So again, thank you for this great presentation. And it does look like we have a couple of questions queued up. And so I'm going to let McKinsey and Dale take it from here. Um, if you'd like to get started on the first one from Kirk. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So the first question we have from Kirk is about the recovery, I believe, of antimony from gold mining in Nevada, um, because it was not economic at the time. Chris, do you have any perspective on that you can share? Sure, I can. Uh, uh, and, and Kirk, that's a that's a pretty notable con comment. It's it's one of one of the issues with a lot of uh, mineralization uh, around the world that contains antimony. It's actually a very common mineral, as as, as Dr. Anderson has noted, uh, and many of us in the exploration world know. Uh, but in higher enough concentrations to recover it, it's actually quite rare. It really is rare in the crust, um, and so. Uh, to recover it as a byproduct, you have to have enough of it, and you have to have enough grade to justify the expense of adding a circuit. Um, and, and that's uncommon in most gold systems. Uh, uh, and antimony tends to occur in clusters worldwide, and there aren't, uh, in terms of ore concentrations. And even though there are lots of antimony occurrences in Nevada, uh, as Kirk has noted, uh, most of them have not been productive from an economic standpoint. Thanks, Chris. So the next question will also go to you um, from Lewis, who's asking about the elements present or the major elements present in our leachate. Well, it really depends uh, uh, on, on the, uh, the leach uh, approach you would use. Uh, but typically, as you uh, if you're using a, an alkali leach, you can end up with a lot of uh, major elements, uh, not only building up in the solution, but also uh, elements such as arsenic and other things of that nature. Although the majority of the, the typical metals that you get concerned with actually drop out in these electro uh, hydrometallurgical electrowinning processes. Uh, one of the bigger issues that can occur is that you end up with scaling in the electrolysis process if you don't get rid of those elements. So you may leave them in the leach solution and drop out or precipitate um, and, and that's the issue is if you then try to further refine the material, uh, Dr. Anderson could obviously expound on this. He's an expert in this field, um, but it is a challenge on any hydrometallurgical site, no matter what the metal is or metal. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the next question we have is from Maxwell. What is the exposure of your antimony production? to the manipulation that you discussed. Chris, do you want to cover a little bit how we're looking at our processing? Sure, um, and thanks for the question. It's actually a, a very important one. Uh, and we thought about this a lot uh, given the past manipulation of the markets. Uh, and that's one of the benefits of having a very large deposit um, with, with lots of uh, the ability to, to, to produce a lot of material. Uh, we would be entering the market in, in somewhere in the top 10 uh, producers in the world, which then gives us the ability uh, to survive uh, manipulation. Uh, and because it's a byproduct, our current mine models, which actually are, are what drives our mining, actually aren't based on the antimony price. Antimony is a pure byproduct. So our pits, our open pits are designed to mine the gold and antimony truly comes out at very little cost. So. Uh, we can we can take on those uh, manipulations in the market because we'd be a very low cost producer. Along those same lines, we're looking at other uh, opportunities to process the sulfide concentrates. 
uh, whether they be via smelting or hydrometallurgical methods. Uh, there are other smelting and refining facilities outside of China. None of them are as large or as, as dominant as the Chinese uh, operations, but we've been in discussions with a number of these people uh, or these companies to look at the opportunities that might be out there to reduce any exposure to Chinese markets. And, and, and our, uh, our discussions with many of these folks uh, indicate that our material is suitable for their plants. So we're, we're in advanced discussions with several of these groups. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think I'll blend the next couple of questions that seem to work nicely with uh, your last one. The first from Yoshiko is, are we planning to do the processing on site all the way to the metal uh, for both gold and antimony? And then um, the next one, uh, well, actually just stick with that one and we'll go from there. So our flow sheet will recover a Doré, a silver gold Doré on site uh, 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 for the precious metals. However, we would not be producing antimony metal on site. Uh, our current plans are to produce a sulfide concentrate uh, and then sell that into the marketplace. Thank you. And then a question from Kirk. If, is there enough arsenic on site to recover it economically? And then Chris, maybe this also blends into, uh, I know there's some uh, discussion around tungsten. I suspect there could be. I mean, there isn't a huge mar uh, 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 market for arsenic. Uh, in reality, you wanna stabilize the arsenic on, a, on any site uh, so that it doesn't enter the environment and, and, and uh, biological receptors. So part of our process uh, is to stabilize the arsenic in the compounds that are not soluble so they can't be released into the environment and be bioreceptible. Um, so I, I can't really answer that we've looked at that. I, I suspect it potentially could be recovered uh, if one were interested in that. I'm not sure that, uh, that there is sufficient economic uh, uh, component to that to, to justify it. Uh, it's not something we've actually looked at. So I, I should say, I don't know is really the right answer there. That's always a fine answer too. Uh, the next one from Mike, Chris, is uh, is there funding for hydrometallurgical development? And maybe you can also discuss some of the challenges we're uh, seeing with hydrometallurgical processing. Well, Mike, that's a good question. Um, I, I'd have to say there might be. Um, if you look at how uh, federal agencies, both Department of Energy and the Department of Defense have been looking at the rare earth problem, which by the way, the Critical Materials Institute has had a uh, a big uh, role in, uh, there has been funding made available for rare earths, uh, both at pilot plants, feasibility studies, and research into various recovery methods, not only from primary rare earth deposits, but also as, as uh, recovery from waste streams. There currently aren't any uh, existing funding sources out there, although DOD has put some money out uh, specifically for uh, work in, in producing materials for the Defense Logistics Agency's uh, National Strategic Stockpile. But that's a relatively small amount of the antimony that's actually out there. Uh, we actually think it should be funding. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think there's some opportunities out there for research uh, that could potentially uh, obtain that funding. Thank you, Chris. So a question from Joseph, is there a substantial gold or silver mineralized into the antimony sulfide product that will leave the site? Uh, there's some. Um, the, the average antimony concentrate will have uh, around uh, 300 grams per ton silver uh, and about 10 grams per ton uh, gold. And that's with a, a sulfide concentrate that will have around 60% antimony in it. So it's a, it's a very high grade antimony concentrate uh, and it cleans up quite well. The, the minor impurities are primarily the pyrite content, which carries the gold, uh, about 5% mineralogically in the concentrate uh, is made up of, of pyrite that's, that's carrying that 10 grams per ton gold. Uh, and then the other remaining uh, gang minerals or waste minerals, if you would, are, are basically feldspar and quartz, uh, another 5% or so. Um, so it's a very clean concentrate uh, and, and basically the gold and silver potentially could be recovered depending on the approach uh, and where it's processed and how it's processed. Thank you. 
And a question from Corby Anderson. He says, I understand that there was a collaboration funded by DOD with USAC. Is that still ongoing? Uh, thanks, Dr. Anderson. I, I, I can't speak for certainty that it is, but I know that, uh, I, I, that they did uh, have a solicitation out uh, in U.S. Antimony won that solicitation to look at potentially processing uh, their materials, uh, both uh, in Mexico and potentially in Montana, uh, to produce material for the national defense stockpile. It's a very specific uh, use. Uh, and, you know, Mexico was at one point in World War II a major processing center and source of antimony uh, besides Bolivia for the allies uh, outside of Stibnite. Again, keep in mind, Stibnite produced 90% of the, the country's needs. Uh, but there were and are small smelters in Mexico uh, that potentially uh, could be of interest uh, uh, for development, uh, and they are in North America versus overseas, uh, which reduces uh, the, the need for shipping and, and lower greenhouse gas emissions because you're not putting stuff on a ship. And then, yes, a follow-up there from Dr. Anderson about Perpetua being involved with uh, U.S. Antimony Corporation. And I'll just take that very quickly. We did sign an agreement to have them start testing some of our concentrate to see how it would work in their facilities. And we're, we've got them in our overall mix of, of evaluating uh, where the best location will be for processing. Chris, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. No, uh, you know, they, they, they've been in, uh, in the antimony business for a long time and uh, they have a relatively small share of the, of the U.S. and world markets. Uh, and given the quantities of material we have, it's important to make sure that we find a home that can, can sustainably uh, and, and consistently produce uh, uh, materials from the quantities. And right now their facilities are uh, a bit smaller than we would want, but that doesn't mean they could not be expanded to, to meet our needs. So and Chris, I want to thank you again for a great presentation. And we do have a few more minutes for some questions. So while we're waiting to see if there are any uh, questions being uh, typed in at this point in time or anybody has anything else they'd like to ask, I would like to ask either of you, based on the questions that have come up, are there any other things that you would like to add um, about your, your company and the efforts, the restoration? Um, and it's just been an interest, uh, really exciting and interesting journey hearing all about everything that you have going on. C Cynthia, thank you for that opportunity. Um, I hope it's not lost on any of you that we are really excited about, about this opportunity. You know, the, the combination of being able to go into a brownfield site that's already been disturbed, find the economic value of such a high grade gold deposit, that allows us to produce this critical mineral antimony and, and be the only mined source of it here in this country. And then now attaching ourselves um, in that production line to this storage battery. Uh, you really just can't get a better project when we talk about how to bring production home all the way from minerals to product. And um, if there are certainly you know, hurdles uh, to get through the system, um, but we're we're just really excited. And you, if you have ideas on, you know, how to help solve some of these challenges, whether it's on the metallurgical side or um, even on, you know, connecting with the type of technology that we're looking at, where we would just be very open to any collaboration. So we have in that time a thank you from uh, Corby, um, and then also another question from Han. A couple of questions, if you'd like to. Uh, pursue those. Yes, so I see the first question from Han is that are there potentially new technologies being developed for brownfield projects in critical minerals uh, like ours? And if we are working then with any technology companies looking at that technology. Um, Chris, I'll, I'll lend that over to you. I'd say there are. Uh, in fact, uh, um, both the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy have been involved in a number of, of, of projects over the years. It's not just yesterday. Some of this has happened. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the, the idea to recover uh, critical materials from coal ash or from spent uh, phosphate ores, in particular rare earth elements that often may be enriched in those uh, waste materials. 
is an area of, of immediate focus. And, and, and some of these involve new technologies that often have come out of think tanks, if you would, uh, like the Critical Materials Institute uh, and your membership. Um, and, and I think that's an important aspect. American innovation is often underrated uh, because of the way we do our trade sometimes. But as a country, we have developed incredible amounts of very useful high-tech uh, uh, processes. And I think it's time that we, we look at supply chains a little differently. And I know uh, those of you that are uh, participants in the Critical Materials Institute get this, but we need to look at supply chains from top to bottom. And that includes the mining end. And, and everybody forgets that, that we still often have to mine to get raw materials. Doesn't mean we can't look at recovering uh, you know, materials as byproducts or as uh, recover them from waste streams or from previously processed ores. And on our site, for instance, we are uh, planning on recycling, if you would, and reprocessing uh, spent materials that remain on the site that are currently an environmental issue uh, and produce uh, a critical material uh, element, uh, antimony from them. So it can be done uh, and it should be done. I'm not so sure if you, uh, you probably already answered this last question from Han. I think you brought it, brought, brought it, brought it together. Is that correct? I guess I'm not sure I answered that, but we, uh, as Mackenzie had noted, we have uh, made a partnership with Ambry, for instance, uh, who had developed this, uh, this great, uh, a large grid scale battery system that relies on antimony. And we have enough antimony to provide a significant amount of that to supply their needs. So uh, to, to answer that question, I'd say, yes, we have. Uh, doesn't mean we can't look at other opportunities as well. Yeah, and I will look add to that too, Chris, that you know whether it's looking at you know, our future fleet and can that be an electric fleet? You know, where the housing facility we have on site, where can we reduce through new technologies um, its environmental footprint and make it more efficient as well. So constantly looking at all aspects of the production line, you know, at a potential project to say, well, what technology is either here or on the verge that could be implemented that lowers that impact of the project itself um, and then also going to feed um, these materials. You know, one thing that Ambry was really excited about with the partnership with Perpetua is that as we look at ESG policy and end users wanting to know what a carbon footprint looks like for an entire supply chain, you know, mining's gonna have to really improve as well, um, our own carbon footprint. And we can do that better here than anywhere else in the world. So it looks like we have another question from Maxwell before we do an ending here. Oh, and another, oh, that was a thank you from Han. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the question from Maxwell is one that I really appreciate. This is really where I've spent the majority of my career um, about gauging a social, social license to operate and what issues may have arisen here. And I think the first perspective from, um, from my point of view is that social license really starts at day one. And it did for this project. And that's one of the reasons I'm here. It is why I believe in this company and our approach to it. And that I'm comfortable with it in my own backyard is that from day one, there was a recognition that we were going to have to listen. We were gonna to have to be transparent and we were gonna to have to find systems of accountability as a company. There's a long history of mining and most people, particularly in the West, haven't seen what modern mining is. What we predominantly see are the scars of the past. And so building that trust needs to start years before a project is development, developed to a stage where it goes out you know, with details to the public. And we were able to do that, working with our local communities. We identified, for example, one of the issues was that um, the town of Yellow Pine, which is a town of about 20 people, 14 miles from the project. Didn't like that our original plan was to potentially cut off uh, access through the site. And so, you know, we sit down and we spent about a year with our engineers and others identifying solutions. Or in the very beginning, we were sitting down and talking with them and saying, wow, you know, access to site today is challenging. Uh, the roads that you have to go in are narrow, there's recreational traffic and they parallel rivers. And that's gonna be a challenge for us. And in fact, it was the community that came to us and said, well, have you ever thought about connecting this old logging road and this old mining road together and accessing site from the other direction? 
And in fact, now that is our preferred option for accessing the site. So there's a process of social license that isn't just going out and talking early, but it's also listening. And it is finding solutions um, wherever we can. Some of the other issues that have come up, of course, so access um, impact to, to local communities that are struggling with growth, how we can help um, accommodate those issues and in advance identify that a problem uh, or a concern might be coming up. So four year, three years ago, we established um, a community agreement between ourselves and eight of the local communities in our region. It guarantees monthly meetings between the leadership of the company and representatives of these communities. And we spend that time answering questions that they bring back to us. We spend that time bringing in, you know, some of the engineers or technical experts so that they can provide information. And then we also spend that time every month talking about what might be ahead. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, what's the impact on our school is going to look like if there's growth with the project or, you know, how can we enter into an agreement with the county on um, impact fees around the road. And so it's that problem solving that can occur now um, that we find really, really helpful. There have been um, concerns brought up by uh, in specifically the Nez Perce tribe. And so we're now working with them through um, a mediation process. Um, they filed two years ago a Clean Water Act lawsuit, was, which is one of those challenges Chris mentioned when you're on a circle site. You know, we didn't create the messes that are up there now, and we are certainly focused on finding solutions to leave that site better than it is today. And I'm, exactly. just at, one last, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I was just looking at Han's next question. Yes, great, um, thank you. Uh, given the various challenges and including the economics of the project, do you envision the project to be um, automated, digitized, and electrified in the operational areas? And you know that's a good question. And Chris, I'll let you weigh in here too. While we are looking for efficiencies, um, we're in a very remote location, and some of that um, will be limited in our ability just in space and and access. Um, but we are looking at how we can add um, more electrification. Uh, to our work up there and um, certainly adopting many of the automated technologies that help us make sure um, that our machines are running safely and you know all of that you know information age the the internet of things uh, that can that can happen on a site like ours um, and will be even advancing in the future. I might add, uh, and it's an important question, we did uh, early on in the project evaluate the use of, for instance, of electric trucks and electric shovels, and things of that nature. Uh, and as, as we looked at those issues uh, or, or those, those opportunities, many of them were driven uh, both by economics, but also by the availability of technology to provide power and, and, and have it reliable. You can't uh, start and stop things like uh, an autoclave or, or your mill, they need to, to run steadily. And that's where things like these big Ambry battery systems mm -hmm. actually may ultimately uh, revise our ultimate development plan. Uh, but to give you an idea, uh, we, we've been operating a, a solar system on site for many, many years to reduce our, our diesel uh, utilization just for on-site equipment that's currently out there and trucks and things of that nature. And it's reduced our diesel consumption uh, on the order of 14 to 15,000 gallons a year, uh, which is a lot fewer trucks going out to a remote site. Uh, we will undoubtedly continue to apply those types of methods uh, where they're practical and, and, and doable. I mean, uh, and, and I, I suspect there will be uh, more electrification of the site uh, as, as we move forward as some of these newer technologies come into uh, actual operational uh, roles. And that's absolutely right. I mean, we have the advantage here in Idaho of having the lowest carbon grid in the nation. And so there's a lot of advantages for us to tap into that however we can. And we do have to upgrade that um, line. So we will be building about 72 new miles or upgraded miles of transmission line to get it to site. It's not today. Um, and so being able to tap more into that electrification uh, especially when it has already such a low carbon footprint is a, is a real advantage for us.
I'd like to thank, um, again, McKinsey and Dale for a great presentation. I'd like to thank all of uh, the attendees today. Uh, this recording is going to be available next week at aimslab.gov slash CMI under the workforce menu. Please join us again October 13th for an overview of the University of Kentucky Strategic Materials and Recovery Technologies, the SMART Center. And uh, these details will be in the Critical Times, also at aimslab.gov slash CMI under the workforce menu. Again, if you have a suggestion, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you everyone for attending today and we look forward to seeing you again on October 13th.